Hello and welcome. My name is Katherine Duncan and I'm part of the Oris marketing team. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. I'm pleased to be joined by Keith Lorenz from UPMC Passamont. And so a lot of the webinars that Oris has hosted in the past have been focused on kind of clinical value of the Monarch platform. And we're excited to bring Keith's perspective as COO from the executive suite to tell us a little bit more about his personal experience with Monarch at UPMC. So we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to Keith to get us started and help us learn a little more. Thanks, Catherine. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sounds great, thank you. Sure, thanks. So I appreciate everybody's time tonight. Really what I would love to be able to do tonight is kind of walk you through um, our journey with the Monarch platform uh, and talk about sort of my institution and how we've had some great successes with the program um, and show you some of the financial and operational tactics, but also uh, just to give an opportunity for some of my peers across the country to ask any questions um, that you may have about the program as we kind of talk about this innovative technology that really is changing uh, how we deliver patient care for our, our patients in the North Hills of Pittsburgh. And so um, just some disclaimer in terms of um, the information that's being shared here and uh, really that this is my experience at, at Passivant uh, and it is really sort of a lot of it is based on the data that we've been able to see um, as we've gone live with the project. And so my, my goal today is really to um, introduce you to myself uh, and then also to UPMC for those of you that are unfamiliar with our health system, but then also to talk about Passivant uh, because I think it's important for those that may work in an integrated system to be able to understand sort of how this platform can help support a lot of the different initiatives that you're working on uh, at multiple sites. Um, and also to kind of talk about the size and the scale of my facility and how that might relate to um, what your experience might be in terms of what you're looking to do. And then kind of talk about uh, the platform itself and really sort of the innovative technique that it brings. And then lastly, to talk about some of our, our rollout. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be quick to share the data because that's what I would like to see first. And then we can kind of talk about our lessons learned as we've gone through the program, but then to really uh, make sure we leave some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a true Pittsburgher, born and bred. Um, you know, I'm, I'm married to my high school sweetheart. You can see my two little rugrats there uh, on the screen. And I, I was I was preparing for this. Um, you know, when we were getting this kicked off, uh, we really announced we were going live with the platform in November of 19. And since then, we've had two kids. Um, so Millie, she turns two on Sunday, and uh, Jack, he's five months old. And so that's my crew right there. Uh, my wife and I, we met in high school. And so my wife actually works in my hospital too. Um, so it's really a community hospital. But I think as we go through this, you'll learn a little bit more uh, that it, it's more than just a community hospital as we prepare to kind of share what we're working on there. Um, from a schooling and a training standpoint, I did my undergraduate work at Miami University in Ohio uh, and completed my master's degree at Pitt uh, for healthcare administration. And then also uh, did a UPMC administrative fellowship and then also completed a, a Lean Six Sigma black belt uh, to kind of focus on some process improvement and different work from that perspective. In terms of my, uh, my employment background, every job that I've ever had has actually been with UPMC. I started my career as a patient transporter at the hospital that I work at now um, in high school and has sort of made my way through the system at different facilities um, and a majority of my career has been spent in hospital operations leadership, uh, but I did have a brief period of time where I worked in uh, academic physician practice management, where I was the division administrator uh, of our pulmonary allergy and critical care medicine academic group. Um, but really, my, my passion is hospital operations, um, really how we can strategically build our market share uh, and partner with our communities as we're trying to go live with some of these projects and then engaging our staff um, and then process improvement, obviously, with my Lean Six Sigma Black Belt. Um, and so my personal interests, um, I loved cooking, I love golfing. And uh, during COVID, I started woodworking. And so um, I still have all my fingers. So I, I've been able to make it through um, that pretty well, but just really enjoy uh, spending time with our, our growing family. And uh, we're taking a little trip to, to Disney for Millie's second birthday, but 
Uh, everybody in my family right now is sick except for me. So we'll kind of see how that shakes out. Everybody's got an ear infection. So I'm not super eager to take these two kids on a plane uh, with their ear infection. So for those of you that are unfamiliar uh, with UPMC, uh, we really started as a, um, a hospital integrated system, really in the hub of Pittsburgh. And uh, over the last probably 18 years or so, I've really had a rapid growth. Um, we are the largest non-governmental employer in the state of Pennsylvania. So we're getting close to 100,000 employees. And uh, I've included a map here that you can see sort of the geography of where our hospitals are spread out. And this will be important as we go through. And I'd like to call your attention to Hammett, which is up here in the Erie region, um, Passivant and Cranberry, which are my two facilities, sort of in the northern region of Pittsburgh, and then Mercy a little bit farther to the south there. But we uh, basically cover the entire state of, of Pennsylvania, except for the Philadelphia region, and then have some presence um, in New York and Western Maryland from a hospital perspective. Um, the UPMC Health Plan has 4 million covered lives um, in, our, in our region in Southwestern PA. It's the largest provider in the region. Our market share is about 40% uh, UPMC Health Plan, and then the rest is uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and then also some of the national payers as well. And um, our physician practice and our advanced practice providers, we uh, have over 6,000 affiliated physicians, and that's across all specialties, academic and community medicine, um, and really focusing on how we can continue to partner uh, with our communities for strategic growth initiatives. And then um, as UPMC has expanded our footprint within the state of Pennsylvania, you know, we're always looking for ways to create a diversified revenue stream. And so we do have a presence internationally, um, really Italy, Ireland, China, and Kazakhstan are really the biggest presence opportunities that UPMC has right now. Uh, and, you know, we've gained some, we've, uh, you know, off, offloaded some, and really those continue to be our four core areas as we continue to grow from UPMC standpoint. Uh, a little bit about Passivant. And so my, my hospital has two inpatient facilities. We have Passivant McCandless, which is really our tertiary hub, and then Passivant Cranberry, which is uh, we run about a census of 10 there, but is really um, an emergency department, uh, an outpatient surgery facility. I'll, I'll call it a medical uh, observation unit that we have at the Cranberry location. But really, the majority of our work is done at the McCandless campus. And so we have a very robust oncology program. The uh, outpatient cancer center that we have uh, between both campuses is the busiest outside of the main academic hub um, in the state of Pennsylvania. For UPMC, so it's a very robust medical and radiation oncology program. Uh, we've built a very robust cardiology program. We recently just kicked off a, a robotic mitral valve repair program with the surgeon that we recruited from uh, Vienna, Austria, and uh, it's been a really great opportunity for our community to be able to get a um, sort of that world class care right there in your community. And then obviously, and this will really tie into everything that we're working on with Monarch our thoracic surgery program. And on the subsequent slide, I'll show you some of our, our, our caseload volume by our specialties, but really the, the robust oncology and thoracic programs have really helped to support um, the success of the Monarch program and the robotic bronchoscopy platform, and really will help us to position ourselves to be successful into the future. Uh, we are a regional ICU referral hub, so we receive patients from uh, a wide geography within the within the Western Pennsylvania region uh, to talk about some of these things. And we are working on a way to competitively grow our market share as we um, continue to continue to go through these things. So it's um, you know it's really a great opportunity for us. We are positioned really well in the northern region of of, Pen of Pittsburgh, and so. From a geographical standpoint, um, we are in a space where our communities, our, our patients love to come visit us because we are in the community, but we can provide uh, a tertiary level of care. So we're really fortunate to be able to have that opportunity. And really, in terms of you know why we chose Monarch, it's it really aligns into all of the different services that we're trying to align into our pulmonary partners just recruited three additional physicians that started uh, within the next four months here. And that as our as we continue to grow, 
our lung cancer and thoracic surgery programs, that's really sort of aligning with where we want to be with Monarch. But I think it's important to think about not just the current state, but really sort of the future. And that's sort of what will line up as we go through this. And then below is just sort of a snapshot uh, of our emergency department visits and our admissions. And uh, I don't include calendar year 20. I ignore everything from an operational standpoint that happened in calendar year 20. I don't think that we can glean any uh, strategic um, data from sort of our operational metrics as we were kind of dealing with our pandemic, uh, but really kind of comparing to where we were with 19 when we were kicking off this program to right now in current state in 21, we've really been able to realize the benefits of this program and maybe the uh, maybe the the pandemic gave us an opportunity to be able to prepare for this a little bit better too because we have a decreased volume in our surgical areas um, and also in our procedural areas. So a little bit about um, what the platform really is. And so, you know, lung cancer continues to be, um, from a oncologic perspective, the biggest focus. And as the technology advances, uh, really the Monarch is the next step into being able to treat uh, lung cancer successfully and effectively. And I think, you know, when you look at the, the graph on the right there, that really shows um, really the value to the Monarch. And as, as you talk to the operators that are using this, um, there really is a learning curve that goes along with it, but their ability to get to lesions uh, earlier detection than we would either with navigational bronch or with CT guided lung biopsy, um, that's where they're really excited is that we can detect and treat um, these cancers much more easily. And this will give us a much better chance to treat these patients uh, effectively to make sure that we can have them continue on um, through their treatment processes. And so um, this really is the value proposition for Monarch as it exists. It's as our technology is advanced, uh, really continuing to make sure that we're able to provide the next level of care for our communities is the next best step um, as we go in there. And, you know, as we've talked to our, our physicians that are using the technology um, the, just watching them do it, you can tell that it's much easier to use than the traditional navigational techniques. And uh, even, you know, CT guided can be imprecise. And so just seeing the ability to, to navigate through um, some of the, the tight airways and get to the different lesions, you can really see that you're able to get to areas that we could never get before. When you layer in the CT guided uh, techniques that we're able to do, it's almost like a GPS for your car as you go through it. So you can see we're able to reach areas that we weren't able to get to easily before. Um, and then we can visualize it um, with the techniques that we have and the technology. And it's, you know, when you see it, it's so minute. It's amazing to think that we're able to navigate through somebody's airway um, to get to these things. And you can see here sort of the technology in action as we're going through and making sure that we're able to um, get to where we need to be with the CT guided portion of it. And then really the precision of the technique, and you can see the background there, um, the monitor. And so it's sort of when you, when you see it in action, it really takes your breath away where it's um, a physician who's using, uh, it looks like a video game controller, and they're following along this navigated path that we've been able to use um, the CT techniques to get to. It's really a remarkable um, type of thing to see happen. And you can see why you're able to make such a precise movement there by um, really using the, the magnification and techniques. And, you know, we'll talk through the learning curve a little bit because it is a bit untraditional um, from, the, from the previous platform. But once our operators got used to it and sort of making sure that when we were going to biopsy that we were getting the lesions that we were thought we were going to, um, it's really been a tremendous success for us. So here's some data on where we are in terms of our, our volume. And so we kicked it off in May of 19. Um, and so we have, or I'm sorry, May of 20. And so we've been live for uh, almost 18 months. And you can see as our ramp up created, um, we've had a bit of a decline. We are our largest user. Um, he turned in his resignation and went to go work at another facility. And we had really built a lot of the program around him. 
And so we've been working to get some of his partners. Um, he was a pulmonologist, and we're also working to make sure that our thoracic surgeons uh, are, are ready to go on this as well. And so that's certainly a lesson learned that we've had as we've gone through here. But I'll, I'll talk through some of these operational metrics. But I think one of the great things to show here is our improvement in the case time. And this just speaks to a point that I'll get to later about the learning curve, because it really is um, something that exists. And we heard about it through the sales meetings and as we were getting the technology, but uh, make sure that you're respectful of that because it is real. And some of your physicians may get frustrated um, as they go through it. And so, um, you know, the top left uh, quadrant here in terms of the table that we're showing here, I think this is really uh, for those of you that are going to be creating an ROI and looking at this, this is the value proposition for you. And so I'd like to keep your attention on the, the green number there because I think that tells the true story. And so basically the way to unpack this is that we have our, our index monarch case. So the actual procedure, the billing and the revenue that we get from that. And obviously the direct expense for that um, is high due to the um, the consumables and just really the actual procedure in and of itself. And then the service expense is sort of all the salaries, the pre-op, the PACU, um, the imaging, any sort of support staff that we have. And so um, really that's what I call our above the line uh, revenue. And really below the line there is the supporting expense for case. And so for those of you that um, have a, a robust infrastructure that supports your facility, um, at UPMC, we call it ESS, Enterprise Shared Services. And so this is really like our local, um, our overhead sweep. And so this is things that are not direct controllables to the procedure, i.e. administrative costs or utilities, um, different things where, you know, central supply, um, some of the fixed costs that we have that are uncontrollable through the procedure. And the reason that I included that and I didn't take it out is that even when you bake in all of those uncontrollable expenses on your overhead, it's still a very positive case for um, your patients. But as we look basically 60 days pre-procedure and up to 60 days post-procedure, and so this would include the initial visit with um, pulmonary or thoracic, the CT work, any sort of diagnostics that would need to occur before then, and then the actual procedure, and then looking up to 60 days post-procedure. And we'll talk through uh, through our first 40 cases, some of the yield that we saw in terms of some of the downstream, but this includes surgical intervention, this includes radiation therapy, this includes medical oncology, uh, but what doesn't include is anything that happens after that 60 days. So if somebody had an extended treatment or uh, follow-up course, or if they went with a non-surgical intervention and then after the conservative treatment realized they needed to go the conservative route, that may not be realized here. So even within this short window where we're looking at 60 days plus and minus the procedure, um, we're realizing a margin of $1,800 per case on that. And so I think that's really from a financial standpoint, um, what you're trying to look at with this is that it's really the, the peri-procedural um, patient care efforts that you're bringing in and really the opportunity um, to get these patients in your door with this technology that you may not have been able to get previously and make sure that you can continue to build your program around that. And then I wanted to show um, this graph on the bottom right, because I think this is important too for um, geographies that are closely populated and densely populated. Um, you know, the question is, you know, can should we get multiple of these or how should that look? And so uh, what this shows is that as we've layered in each of these sites, uh, we've been able to keep our volume increasing or, or at least flat at all of those areas. And so we haven't cannibalized market share internally within UPMC. And I would just encourage you to think about it like any other robotic platform that you have or a CT guided platform that you have or another you know, navigational bronc. It wasn't just one site that was doing it. This was a standard of care. And as the, the Monarch becomes more prevalent, this really is the standard of care for the next wave of treatment of some of the, the lung cancer cases. And so through our first 40 cases, um, so like I said, the learning curve is real. And I'm, I'm going to continue to reiterate that because I think it's important that um, as administrators and operators, uh, we're mindful of that. And we need to make sure that we trust the process. Um, so through those first 40 cases, we had 30 diagnoses, um, 17 malignancies, and then there were 10 others. Um, and so of those others, uh, we were able to get tissue via CT guided biopsy 
Um, and some of them happen very early on. And so they were, the biopsy technique is different than what we're traditionally used to. And so this was an opportunity for us to continue to learn and trust the process and kind of get used to it. Um, we had 15 referrals to thoracic surgery for surgical resection. And so you can see that, you know, within the first, you know, four or five months, we were able to get 15 uh, thoracic surgery cases and then nine referrals to uh, either medical or radiation oncology for chemo or, or radiation therapies. And really, you know, as we, the location and the geography within the lung were very difficult to, to, to biopsy. And so, you know, our, our operators did not cherry pick their cases um, to make sure they would be easy. They wanted to test themselves and test the technology. And I think as we got used to it, we were really able to show the success of what happens here. So a few lessons learned from a pre-implementation standpoint. Um, you know, like I mentioned, the ROI is the, the procedure is not the winner. It's everything that encompasses getting that patient into your organization that you may not have able to have gotten previously. Um, and then thinking about some of the indirect items. And so, you know, we, by, by taking this volume out of the GI lab and out of IR, um, we've been able to backfill that time in that location. And so it's not necessarily that um, we took volume and didn't backfill it. So with the, the cases that we were able to bring into our other areas, we didn't see a decrease in our IR volume and we didn't see a, a, a decreased utilization in our GI lab. And so, you know, you have a backlog of patients that you can decompress. So if you think about your, your CT guy, lung biopsy volume that you're doing, look at that number and think about decreasing that and then backfilling that with your average margin for some of your other cases. And that's kind of what shows where you are for some of those other things. And then secondarily, the, the platform for growth is really what we're trying to do here. And, um, uh, and so we're trying to be able to um, be able to get through the process. And so, as you can see, you know, there's scalability to this platform as we're trying to go live with this. And so, um, you know, we're able to be able to, you know, build our, our model to make it work here and then scale it up. And so, um, I'm excited about the next wave in terms of what's coming next from the Monarch standpoint, as this technology really continues to enhance and develop and, you know, having the support of such a large one technological leader, but also a healthcare leader, um, that's really where I think that we're going to see a lot of great enhancements to this as we come down the line. So continue to position yourself for areas where you might see growth um, as you come through those things to be able to think about. And then also, um, we've seen a decrease in complication rates, the, the ability to be more precise. We've seen a decrease in our uh, post-procedure pneumothorax rate. And so, you know, not even is this a good technology and it's great. It's also the best thing to do for our patient care, which I think is ultimately um, the, the decision that we're trying to make from a, a patient care and operations standpoint as we go through it. Um, so a few more lessons learned. Um, you know, like I said, the training curve is real. And so you can see our case time and how we've been able to manage through that. And so we've almost cut it in half. And so I think this is really important to think about as you're planning is give yourself time in the beginning don't overload your schedule because it's going to take more time than you think it's going to. And, you know, the implementation team will be able to help you with that. But uh, I think it's, you know, trust them. They've done it before and it's, it is real. Um, and also consider multiple super users. Like I mentioned, when one of our physicians left, um, he, we, we saw a decrease in our volume and our utilization. We're working to get that ramped back up. And so um, identify those that you think would be able to um, help out with this and really kind of leverage the multi-modality in terms of pulmonary and thoracic surgery uh, to kind of get used to it. And then also think about your marketing plan. So with the provider roadshow, think about your key referrals that you get for pulmonary medicine or for thoracic surgery and talk about this technology with them. It's the lower complication rate, um, it's, it's more effective for patient care. We're able to treat areas and diagnose lesions that we weren't able to do before. Um, and you can see Todd, uh, who's one of our sales reps that helped us out with the program. We actually had an event in the cafeteria at Pass Event where we brought the robot and let our staff use it and play with it. And they could kind of see 
how really precise and accurate the technology is. And it got everybody excited about the Go Live too. And this was uh, a kickoff that we did in November of 19. And we went live with our program in May. And so this was really sort of the, just to kind of start to get the momentum going for that. And you can actually see uh, the two users here are actually two of our techs that work in the OR. Um, and so they're seeing it every day. And so it's been exciting to kind of see it through fruition. And from a, a, a patient marketing standpoint, you know, being able to get this out there and talking about what the benefits are in terms of um, the opportunities to treat and diagnose lesions that we couldn't before and also the, the safety outcomes. And we see in a lot of our robotic platforms when we do patient marketing pieces talking about robotics, those are the most well-received that we have. You know, the our public sees robotics and they think it's, it's the safest, it's the most advanced, it's the most technologically um, way that they can get their care. And so I think being able to, to tout it because it really is a very unique way to do it. And it's really, um, you know, when we talk to the users that are in the room every day, um, they love the technology and think it's just a great experience. So some other things um, for, for those that may have a very robust uh, network security program, the, uh, the evaluation from our IT enterprise infrastructure was probably the biggest rate limiting step to going live with this program. So give yourself ample time to be able to diagnose some of the networking things. And um, the really great feature about having the support team being able to remote into the machine to perform diagnostics um, is great from my perspective because we can potentially mitigate downtime, but from the IT standpoint, that's a vulnerability from a network standpoint. Um, so just making sure that you're getting your IT team involved very soon on this. Um, you know, it's, it was interesting to see, I uh, thinking back on this, our biggest operational hiccup that we had was probably with pathology and talking through, um, should we be doing touch prep or frozen section? Because one of our operators preferred touch prep and one of them preferred frozen section. And um, it was a, a big sticking point with our pathologists as we were going live with this. And so, um, you know, the processing of the specimens in the OR, uh, we should have spent a little more time on talking through that. We were eventually able to get through it uh, to make sure that uh, we were doing what was best for our patient care. But also, um, it was interesting that, um, you know, we probably saw an increase in cytopath uh, in the first few months because our operators wanted to be sure that they were really getting uh, the tissues that they thought. And we sort of backed off on that as we got more experience with everything, but just kind of keep that in mind with your pathology. And then, like I mentioned, the downstream benefits. So think about where you might be doing um, lung biopsies now and the opportunity to backfill that with additional incremental revenue, because it's it's been a big success for us. We have not seen a decrement um, in either of those areas. And so this really allowed us to provide better patient care for all of those different modalities by adding this technology. Um, so post implementation, uh, you know, the, the technology is portable, but I would encourage you to think hard about where you want it to be placed. And I, there's a few reasons for that. One is, um, you know, as the other modalities come live with this, you're gonna want this in your OR because that's where your proceduralists are gonna be. And so, if you build your workflow to be in your Bronc lab or somewhere, um, it's going to be hard to unwind that if you're only using one platform uh, because it's um, you're going to have all these people that work in the OR that want to use it, and you're going to have to figure out a new workflow as you go through that. And additionally, you know, in, in UPMC, at least in my hospital, where we've built a lot of new procedural rooms, um, you know, we have multiple data ports in those rooms, and uh, getting the equipment hooked up. Uh, we had issues uh, making sure we had everything plugged into the right area. And it was just operationally a big concern. And then if everything was on the same floor, like if your bronc lab and your OR were sort of contiguous to each other, I wouldn't think it'd be such a big deal. But in my hospital, we're a few floors apart. Um, and then just getting things on and off the elevator can be problematic, but then also the reliability of the elevator too. Um, we've had equipment get stranded in an entrapment in the elevator. So just kind of be mindful of that as you're thinking about it. Um, E-bus billing, you know, we had the, the, the good fortune of having another UPMC hospital that went live with this platform. And so we were able to compare our revenue per case to what Hammett was doing. And we realized that 
uh, we were seeing a much lower revenue per case than they were. And granted, a lot of that is market geographies and negotiated rates, but also it was a pretty significant number. And when we looked at it, we saw that we were missing opportunities to bill for eBus when we were actually doing it. And so now whenever we have one of these on our OR schedule, uh, we always include possible eBus. So that way when our billers are looking back through the chart review, um, if they have any, if they see it, they know to look for it. And so this was just a lesson learned from us. It's, we've changed the way that our, our scheduling is built in Surgenet to be able to accommodate for possible eBus. And so um, that was something we've had a 100% uh, capture rate on that. So that's been a, a big win for us. You know, in, in the beginning, I would encourage you to, to do a hot wash post procedure on every procedure for a while. And um, this really is an opportunity for everybody that's involved with the case from respiratory to the operator, to anesthesia, um, to people that are setting up and breaking down the room, what went well, what didn't work well, what did you see that could have happened that didn't happen? You know, anesthesia, they're able to, to really kind of help keep the room together. And I think relying on their perspective of sort of the tenor of the room as we were going through these procedures um, was helpful for us. So I would just encourage you to get all your key stakeholders together and review it because you can really tackle some operational things quickly as you're going through that and really improve your practice uh, procedure to procedure uh, to make sure that you're doing what you can to help move those things through. And then, you know, lastly, I, I've mentioned this a few times, is that um, from an integrated system, can multiple platforms be supported? And I, I would argue that the answer is easily yes. And it's, like I said, it's as this technology evolves, it's the new way to be able to deliver this care and each of your facilities have an have a way to do this now, and this is the next way to do it. And as you continue to, to build the programs, you're gonna have a need for this in your community. And I, I've told Todd and Doug from the sales team, like I anticipate that in 18 months, I'm probably gonna be looking to purchase another one uh, because as the new programs get rolled out, my, my other services that could potentially use this are so busy. Um, we're going to have people fighting over it. And so um, I anticipate that we're going to be looking to add additional ad passive in because it's really um, it's it's friendly for the users. It's great for patients. Um, and it's a, a it's really the best way to be delivering care for op where we have those opportunities. And so um, that's just sort of our quick spiel for how we wanted to run through everything. And uh, I really appreciate everybody's time and sort of hearing about our hospital and I'm proud of our team um, in terms of what we've been able to accomplish with this and uh, really appreciate the opportunity from Catherine to be able to help uh, as we've built this program to kind of talk about it. It's, it's I'm, I'm really proud of how the team has done over the last 18 months dealing through the COVID pandemic and also not only kicking off this program, but we've implemented several new programs um robotic and non-robotic and it's um i it's i'm just really glad to be able to share a lot of the hard work from this team so um thanks for the opportunity